So, hi everybody. As you just heard, the topic is how technology transforms urban systems, and as we know, intent is the T is for technology. And when I was uh, when I studied architecture, urban planning at school, I was always fascinated about really what great visions architects had in the past. It was in the 50s, in the 30s of the last century, and it was really great visions of how we will live and work tomorrow and how we will organize space through new technology. And I would just take you on a little tour then, maybe sh uh, show you, uh, we have to go back a little bit to, to see how technology has formed the city and what is the actual impact you can say today, and then see what might be the outcome or the outlook, of course, of the next decades we have before us. So if we go back a little bit, I, I'm sure some of you know the, the series The Jetsons, which, was, uh, started, which started in the 60s. And uh, the Jetsons was a family that at that time yeah, living in the 21st century and it was really, they had all kinds of technologies, appliances and it, the technology really uh, made their life more comfortable. Fun fact is of course that we, when they thought in the 60s about uh, future information, they just had these punch cards to order the flying meals, so it was not everything so, so much forward. But of course technology was at that time really at, at a different point and if you just look at back at that time for in the 60s and you just read the speech uh, which, which Kennedy made in 1962. It was just five years after the US got that Sputnik shock uh, when the Russians uh, shot the first satellite in the, in the space. And they just said in 62 then, okay, we want to go to the moon until the end of the decade. And we want, we want to do it not because it's easy, because it's hard. And it's really interesting that you, uh, if you think about what just politics, industry and research or science achieved at that moment, they had this vision, they joined all the forces they had, and they managed it and put the first man on the moon at that time. So I think it was a pretty exciting time, definitely. So to skip forward maybe 50 years, yeah, we talked about today to urban planners and architects and asked them, what is your future vision and how, what technology are you using in, in your plannings? Then you get different answers, of course, yeah, and it's, yeah, well, may, there might be other problems today than, than technology in some cases, so. Maybe it's important or it's, uh, we should just have a look at city as itself and if we want to put it in some kind of equation. So the city, of course, it consists of humans. We have human culture, we have human processes, we have individual lifestyles. So I think the city is pretty much, of course, for humans. As well, we have technology, of course. We need infrastructures, we have different technologies we're using to work or how to order, uh, supply our food chain and whatever. So technology, I think it's also as essential as, as culture there. And of course, we have some limited factors like resources, of course, below the bar, and we have the space we are using, or the cities uh, we are living in are using. And if we look at these three factors here, we see that all of them really are limited. Human development or population growth will have an end in this century, I think. Resources we are using, most of them are finite and they will uh, deplete. And of course, we have space we can use more and more efficiently, but actually it's also finite, definitely, on this Earth. And the interesting part is that the technology we have has always, throughout history, been an unlimited resource. And you always have been a new solutions to existing problem or existing challenge. So actually, what have we done then in the last, in the, in this past? We have built cities. And today, it's not about cities, I would say. And if we talk about city 2.0, I think it's really interesting to think about the anthroposphere. The first age, the first era, man has created and actively shaped the surface of this earth. So it's not about the city, I would say, it's really, we have this kind of surface all around our planet and it's the, the habitat we are living in actually. So I just want to have you a short uh, introduction or maybe a short review then about the last uh, 300 years and have a look at these different ages that I want to just go quickly on. And to start with, of course, maybe if we go far away, we had this manual age. Manual because we had manual labor. Everybody at that time had a life expectancy maybe of 35 years. People worked 80 hours a week, so not pretty much compared to today. And the cities we had at that time, you can see in the small pictures, was about perfect geometric forms and it was about central power. And, and of course they had a very important issue, they provided security. If you look at the city of that time, for example here, it's pretty much easy structures. You have city walls, you have the church, you have the town hall in the middle, you have housing around and you have the fields outside the wall uh, to supply the city with. So at that time life was hard, but simple maybe. So if we skip forward then to the mechanical age, which is about pretty much from 1700 to 1850, you also see that cities there at that time are changing. 
it was not only about providing security. If you look at cities like New York or Washington, it was also about money. Suddenly, it was about real estate, it was about providing spaces for a growing population all over the world. And why was it like that? What was the, the, the key driver, the key technology? It was a technology like this, the spinning jenny from Richard Arkwright in 1764. And it was not about mechanizing work at all, or of course it was uh, to some part, but the actual interesting part is that you uh, didn't replace a worker by a machine. It was that uh, just the case that you increased productivity instead. You could uh, put a machine like this one, and you, not, uh, you don't need only one supplier anymore to support this machine, you need six. So you just pro uh, increase the productivity by six. And that was the time, of course, when, when cities really got that huge population growth and migration from all over the world. And a nice aspect, if you look at infrastructure technology, for example, is that uh, the city of Vienna was the first one, I think, of the, of the whole world at that time to have a full sewage system to provide, you can say, sanitary, hygienic uh, conditions for all of the 400,000 inhabitants. And that one got a role model for, for uh, a lot of other cities at that time. And you can say this was one of the first centralized systems, or urban systems, as we call it, uh, in the city, which connected all the buildings together and, uh, under one roof or one technical uh, condition, you can say. So what comes after then? We have the industrial age, of course. It's like the second industrial revolution, if you want. And we had the problem, really, that we have to restructure our cities. We had Paris, for example, where there has been the Haussmann uh, reor uh, reorganization, where, where it really was about how to manage this sheer growth of city, this sheer population growth within the visible, uh, the, within the, the space there is available in it. And we had technologies, for example, like this one. It was the, uh, the, the railway, which was uh, invented at first in, in 1826, but then few decades later, you had the idea of put it underground. Why do we have it uh, on the surface if we can put it underground? And this one is the picture of the first underground railway that we had in, in London in 1863. And it just was the first time, you can say, when, when mass transports enabled people to work at one place and uh, live at another. And it was just a rush then at the end of the 19th century. And London at that time grew to the biggest mega city in the world. And this was the horizontal dimension, you can say. Another part which happened pretty much at the same time was the elevator. There was a, a time, 1854, in the World, for a new World Fair in New York, when Elisha Otis stood on that platform, and you just have to think about what the people were thinking when he just cut his own rope the platform was hanging on. And of course, it didn't happen because he invented that kind of safety mechanism, and everybody saw, okay, this is technology, and yeah, if you just think about then the next decades, you had this vertical high-rise evolution of the cities. You had New York with the first skyscrapers. You had advanced in construction technologies and, and other stuff. And this was the vertical dimension of the cities, and it was all dependent on this single technology, you can say. And if you skip forward a little bit, of course, there was something like the the draft of La Ville Radieuse from Le Corbusier in 1924, and I just like this picture because he still has this, his, this figure like, like uh, Michelangelo in, in his Sixtinian chapel, when he thinks, yeah, I have under everything under control, and I have space, and I reorganize space, and I use technology, and everything is fine. Of course, this one was never built, and also because of, well, technical evolution go, went on, and you can say we had then shortly after the digital age, from 1950 maybe to 2000, or already today, and this one changed a lot, uh, definitely, in the in, uh, case of technology. So does anybody know what this is? This is actually, you can say, the father of the smart city, maybe, or the father of the Internet of Things. And it was the first integrated circuit, or microchip, Jack Kilby invented in 1959 at Texas Instrument. And you just think about, if you heard this morning, this talk about uh, the the uh, quote of Thomas Watson from IBM when he said, four years later, I think there's a market for five computers worldwide. And four years earlier, we had this invention, and you can just think for yourself, then we had the personal computer, and we have today everything, uh, computers in our pockets, in smartphones, and other stuff, so we have today, I think it's already seven billion devices which all have the technology with what, uh, which was invented at that time. And of course, if you look then on urban development, uh, you see that suburban settlement grew on, you had this urban sprawl in the US, and it was not only because of the digital age, of course, you had other well, rise of comfort technologies, you had affordable cars, you had refrigerators, you had 
washing machines for each household and everybody liked it because it was, they made it independent and you see how the, what impact it had of course on the city development. And this is actually the heritage we have to deal with today still. And this one was only part for the Northern Hemisphere. If you think about when went this whole urbanization or when, uh, when did it take place on the Southern Hemisphere, it was dependent on one key technology, you can say. And it was the invention of the in-window air conditioner in 1948. Uh, and this one, if you look on just this example here on this picture, was really the, the driver for office high-rises, for, for, for new urban space all over the Southern Hemisphere. And you just see, if you look back on the last 50 years, how this uh, development took off after that. So actually, where are we today? If you look at uh, after the short history I just showed you, maybe uh, I have to, or I dare to say, that we have lost a little bit of, or we lost or decreased our human degrees of freedom. Of course, we had this manual age where, where we were still very, where life was hard, but we were still, uh, we had, pretty much uh, everything under control, you can say. We had very clear uh, borders and we knew what was important. And then we had new technologies, you can say, in the mechanical age, in the industrial age, digital age. And actually, I would say really the, the, the human or we as a society went, uh, moved out of the city a little bit. It was not, was not only about human development anymore or, or our human individual uh, demands we're having. So the key question is then, what is the next step actually? Where are we heading to in the future? And this one, in my case, or in my opinion, will be the parametric age, which will last until the mid of the century, maybe. And this is, these are just some examples of how future cities might look like, and I th think you have already seen some, some uh, similar examples today. So today we are at the point that we have a new transparency of urban processes, and I think you, had great talk you heard some great talks before, that it's about we are at the first time in history at that point where we can join emotions, idea, resources, know-how, so we can create new value chains, actually, and uh, come up with new solutions, like based on GPS data, or crowdsourcing, or gaming, and it's really just the, the opportunity we have to combine different demands and solutions to new urban systems. We have a, a technology driver like smartphoneication, for example. Uh, when you the first smartphone in 2007, the iPhone, for example, uh, went on the market, it was not only about communication, it was also about a sensor system. And you have today in our smartphones, GPS, motion sensors, acceleration sensors, and some others. So you can say today, if you look at the whole uh, amount of, of smartphones and mobile devices we have, it's something like a neural backbone of our society. I think the talk of Thomas before it pretty much showed this one this aspect. And we have the development, of course, that it's not only or not anymore the human which has to adapt to machines in some cases. And if you look at this example, for example, the bionic handling assistant, you see that technology gets more and more biology-like, bionic or more human adapted. So you can say it becomes soft. And we have new, uh, new uh, drivers in, in energy, for example, in energy systems. So it's not only about having centralized systems with a power plant on the one side of the a region and, sense and supplying the, the whole region, we can actually we can mimic or imitate uh, the energy generation like nature has shown us. And in this example of, of uh, alga microreactors, we can produce biomass wherever we like and can uh, turn it into energy. And of course, if we think about how our economy works, I think it's interesting to have a look at this emerging share economy or shared economy. We have open innovation, we have crowdsourcing, we have co-funding, we just turn around actually the, the, the uh, wealth creation processes we had in the past. And I think the example of, of shared mobility, of course, is a good way uh, to look at it, but I think it's, it's much bigger and it becomes much more important. And we have this kind of disruptive technology like 3D printing. And it's not about, uh, it's just the example here, what you see, of course, from material, but it's interesting to see that we can really uh, create new production chains, actually. We have new machines and we can create spaces like this structure here, for example, in free space. And it's just a matter of time, I think maybe five to ten years, that we will create first urban infrastructures, housing or high-rises with that technology. So actually, what is the parametric age about? It's about creating new value systems or value creation systems based on human and technology parameters. So it's not only that we have to rely on the infrastructures we have, we already have. It's also about thinking how can we combine our urban, uh, our, our human demands, our human ideas, and how can, can we combine it with technology in a, good, in a good way. 
So this one, of course, are just a few examples then what will be a part of it. It will be a part of a mass customization. We will have, we can create completely individual products and we can base this one of of resources which are not finite and maybe um, plastics, bioplastics, which are re reduced uh, or can be reduced 100 or times and more. We have crowd, uh, we have uh, a cloud mobility, for example, we have network processes. And as I said before, we can really combine these different aspects we have today in our cities in a good way and can create new, smaller and other urban systems in the future. So what does this mean for the city of tomorrow, if you look at it on, on this, the time scale again? Actually, the last three centuries has all led us to this kind of decentralization of urban systems. When we talk about these uh, features you just saw before about energy generation, communication, and so on, it really has distributed or spread up this kind of hard and heavy technology we had in the past, like water infrastructures and vast power grids. And I think the parametric age will just lead us to this point where we can reorganize these problems we have, how, we, how to supply uh, citizens, how to grant mobility in the, in the city of the future, and so on. So I just want to show you maybe this one in, in the short graph. So maybe you can consider cities today as megastructures. If you look at Hamburg, it's a large urban area, of course, and it has some centralistic or central systems like mobility system or the, or the water infrastructure or the energy system. And the idea is, or what is or actually what we have to do in future, I think, is to, to invent, of course, and induce the right technologies, which might lead to distributed urban systems, to the development of new light urban systems, and also to the, uh, to the opportunity or the, the, uh, the chance where we can reorganize our urban spaces, maybe create micro-neighborhoods which have uh, their own energy supply or some other uh, microstructures which are more human-like and maybe more are, are more based on, on the communities we have or the, the community structures in, in between. So one thing is for sure, our environment is dynamic and the question is, or actually maybe everybody has its own opinion, what are our cities today? Are these this large dinosaurs which are relying on a lot of supplies of resources and take up a lot? Or, and will they manage maybe that jump from, from this large and heavy life cycle, you can say, to a more evolutionary and more dynamic system? So what we are doing for this kind is, well, research and development for kind of urban systems. And uh, these are just some examples where we're trying to set up technology and to implement technology in cities and together with cities and industry partners to help this kind of evolutionary urban development. Where you can see that, we, for example, a system like e-ready housing, how, how can you create a building, a housing building, for example, which not only supports or generates energy for its own, but also maybe for the environment or for a mobility system you also have in a neighborhood. Or, for example, uh, how can you turn a parking garage uh, into a micro-smart grid which might in the control energy intelligently? If you look on that map from Hamburg from 1800, and I already uh, put the X where we are right now, maybe it's interesting to adapt the quote of, of Darwin a little bit. So it's not the strongest of the cities, nor the most intelligent that survives. It's the, most one, uh, it's the one most adaptable to change. Thank you.